And then he jumps right into the um, the primary question, taken in judgment or salvation? What does he uh, think? All right, now we're going to get into a little bit of the Greek, uh, which was um, helpful for us. There we go. All right, let's keep going. He says, the Greek word used in Matthew 24, 40 to 41 is paralambano. Just like I said earlier, I, my memory was correct. So, Matthew 24, when it says, um, um, taken to ourselves. Now, let me let me stop for a moment and get uh, go a little bit slower. Because I need you to see this uh, uh, Greek here. So, let me find uh, the word taken. There we go. All right, so um, I suppose I can just scroll down to verse 40. This is the entire um, passage in a uh, uh, what we call a uh, interlinear, where we can see the Hebrew, I'm sorry, where we can see the, the English and the Greek. Uh, so going back to verse 40. Uh, then will be two in the, I'm sorry, let me back up actually to verse 39. Uh, the English part of this interlinear is a bit difficult to read just because the word order matches the Greek. So it's not going to be what you're used to, but I think you can still understand even though the word order is uh, not quite the same. But uh, starting in verse 39, and not they knew until came the flood and took them all away. So notice in the um, English for the word took here, the Greek word is um, eren, which is Strong's number 142. Eren is not the same Greek word that we're going to read about here in a moment. I've already told you it's paralambano. But the um, flood came and took them, Aaron, all away. Only in the English do we see took, and in the talks about two men will be taken, it's a, um, a similar form of the word took, taken, right? So they're related words there in the English, but in the Greek, they're two different words. And this bears relevance to the study as well. So just bear with me on the technicalities. When we get down to verse 40, Jesus says, then will be two in the field. One is taken. And we can see now um, here, paralambanetai, paralambanetai, which is rooted in the word paralambano, which the pastor is going to highlight. It's Strong's number 3880, a completely different word. Greek word. So now when he says two are taken, uh, one will be taken, one will be left, the paralambanetai is taken um, as a Greek word, big, long, meaty Greek word. And the Greek word we're going to find here when he talks about it is a taking unto oneself. This will be very important when we get to the final analysis, but I don't want to tip all of my cards just yet. But two men will be take, two will be taken, one is, one is taken and one is left, and the one that's taken is the paralambanetai. Uh, rooted in the word para lambano, and then uh, verse forty-one: two women will be grinding at the mill. One is taken. Same thing here. Same Greek word. Same form. Also para lambanetai, rooted in the word para lambano. Strong's number thirty-eight eighty, and one is left. And then he finishes the verse with telling us to keep watch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are the Greek terms before us. Now going back to uh, this um, pastor um that we were uh that we're looking at the greek word used in matthew 24 40 through 41 for the taken and left not um the flood came and took them all away that's a different greek word we've already established that now we're just talking about uh, the two and the separation, one taken, one will be left. Uh, para lambano made up the root word lambano, which means take or receive, and the preposition para, which means alongside of. Thus, the meaning of this verb is, quote, to take into close association, take to oneself, take along with. The only place that I could find where this word is clearly used of the rapture is of Christ's initial disclosure of this mystery in John 14.3. And we've um, quoted this verse in our previous study as well. I will come again and receive you to myself. The word receive in the English is the original Greek word para lambano, para lambano. All right, I will receive you to myself. The whole phrase there. And that's the end of John 14, 3. He goes on to say that since para lambano is not a technical term that has the same meaning in every instance, it is used in the New Testament. Like any word in a language, usage must be determined by how it is used in a given context. All right. 
He continues, I want to finish through this part tonight. Some have tried to argue that taken here refers to the pre-trib rapture, right? So notice he's making two disagreements. He's disagreeing that the time frame is the rapture. He thinks that the time frame is the second coming at the far right of all the slides that we've been looking at, right? The, the second coming. He also disagrees with who is taken and who is left in the overall sense of the use of the words. So, he says, there's a small minority of pre-tribulationists that see these two verses as a reference to the rapture. For example, David L. Cooper says, quote, the dominant idea is that the one who is a child of God will be taken, whereas the one who has never made his peace with the Lord will be left to pass into the great tribulation. As Louis Barbieri has noted, quote, the Lord was not describing the rapture for the removal of the church. Uh, for not describing the rapture, for the removal of the church will not be a judgment on the church. If this were the rapture, as some commentators affirm, the rapture would have to be post-tribulational, for this event occurs immediately before the Lord's return in glory, and it definitely occurs after the rapture, or after the uh, tribulation. Because Jesus even said, in case you weren't catching it, if we go back over to Matthew in 24, uh, going back up to verse... Uh, uh, 29, he says, but he immediately when after the tribulation in those days. So the time frame is after the tribulation. Now here's the beautiful part. If this is a seven year tribulation, then this return, this coming here that, that is mentioned in verse 30, where he said, they'll see the sign of the sun. They'll see the son of man coming on the clouds in, of the sky. Since this is definitely after the tribulation, because it's unmistakable that he says that in verse 29 and 30, then if this is talking about a post if this is talking about a pre-trib pre-millennial um time frame then it definitely is the second coming and the um the timing of yeshua's coming is after the after the tribulation second coming time of his second coming so let me show this to you in the charts that i'm talking about um meaning this chart right here would be a good representational. We have a pre-trib rapture on the far left. Then we have a seven-year tribulation. Then we have a post-trib second coming at the far right. So the rapture on the far left and the second coming at the far right are separated by seven years. So if that's the case, then when Jesus says, after the tribulation of those days, then they'll see the Son of Man coming. That kind of matches with this particular chart. But here's the beautiful part. If we took a pre-wrath view, and we take that the tribulation is starting at the midpoint of the week, <coughs> excuse me, starts at the midpoint of the week, not at the far left at the beginning of the seven years, but starts at the midpoint, and then only runs for a short time and is cut short by the day of the Lord, then we still have a rapture happening after the great tribulation, and we also have the second coming happening after the tribulation. So generically speaking, we still have a uh, Jesus arriving on planet Earth or coming um, after a tribulation, chrono chronologically speaking. Whether you stretch the tribulation out seven years or make it a very short time, uh, or whether you call it the second, uh, the, the the tribulation or the second coming, we still have it happening. That great event, that coming, that arrival, happening after a tribulation, no matter how long you put the tribulation. Likewise, with this post-trib rapture view, where the rapture and the second coming are essentially smashed into the same event, they both take place after the tribulation. So there's really not a huge point to be made or to be gleaned from saying that the second coming of Messiah happens after the tribulation. If you haven't defined how long the tribulation is, and you haven't defined what is exactly meant by the second coming. If you're generically saying the second coming takes place after a time period of tribulation, you haven't really said much is the point I'm trying to highlight. So, um, uh, so that's good that we, we at least know those basics. So um, let's keep reading this gentleman's uh, commentary. Some have said that Pater Lambano is only used of positive relations, right? Re taking you to myself. However, such is not the case, as is used in the Roman soldiers taking Jesus away from the Garden of Gethsemane to the Praetorium and eventual crucifixion in Matthew and John. 
Uh, he continues, it's used of the devil taking Jesus with him to show him all the kingdoms of this world in Matthew. This verb is also used of the exercised demon returning to the newly slept house and taking with it seven other spirits in Matthew and in Luke. Stan to Saint discusses this matter as follows. So, we're asking, is the Greek always used in a positive sense where someone takes another person to themselves in a positive manner the way that Jesus should be taking believers to himself in a positive way if that's indeed the correct view is this a description of the rapture of the church or of the taking of the wicked to judgment those who take the former position argue that to take para lambano the verb used here is to be differentiated from take which we looked at earlier airo um where um, the flood took them all away. The verb used in verse 39, right? Airo is, and let me just show it to you again. So we have parlambanatai in verse uh, 41, as well as in verse uh, 40 here, right there, parlambanatai. But earlier up into verse 39, we had. Um, Aaron, which is a root word, uh, uh, Aero. So, two different Greek words. That's what this um, pastor is highlighting, or this quote here. He goes on to say, It's asserted that para lambano signifies the act whereby Christ received his own to himself. However, para lambano is also used in a bad sense in Matthew and in John. And since it is paralleled in, th in thought with those who were taken in the judgment of the flood, it is best to refer the verb to the verb refer the verb to those who were taken for judgment preceding the establishment of the kingdom the far right of the chart that we've been looking at he continues the difference in verbs can be accounted for on the basis of accuracy of description quote the flood came and swept them all away is a good translation instead of saying the flood came and took them all away we also noted that um last time if we go back to uh, matthew's rendering of this story and we go drop down to um verse uh 39 just verse 39 here and they did not understand until the flood came and did what took them all away which is the root word airo took them all away so will the coming of the son of man be but when we compared this to the luke account which does mention the um uh the 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 noah the details with noah let me find it here here we go it is verse 27 it says people were eating they were drinking they were marrying and they were be being given in marriage until the day that what no into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them notice it doesn't even use the word iro the word destroyed there is not the same uh i'd have to look it up but just trust me it's if, if it was destroyed if it was iro it would be a form of the word took just to be sure let's just bring it up anyway i should have done this earlier but let me pull up the greek from that word Scrolling down, the uh, then the flood came and destroyed Apollosin, right? Apollosin is Strong's number 622. So it's definitely different from Iro, right? So destroyed is a completely different word. So um, going back to this pastor's commentary, he's got this contextual consideration. And let's read that now. He says, for me, the strongest reason to take the separation depicted in this passage as a reference to one's taking away in judgment. Remember, he believes that this passage in Matthew is talking about the second coming, not the rapture. This is extremely important in our discussion about taking a left because of the differences in the two accounts that we've already kind of noticed, which I hope to get to tonight and finish this particular uh, aspect. For me, the strongest reason is because the reference taken in judgment is the context it appears that matthew 24 40 and 41 are illustrating that which preceded it in matthew 24 uh 36 to 39 namely that those who were not prepared in the days of noah were taken away in judgment by the flood verse 39 ends by saying so shall the coming of the son of man be clearly the emphasis in this verse is on unbelievers being taken away in judgment in the judgment of the flood therefore verses 40 and 41 drive that point home by giving a couple of examples of the coming separation that will occur at this time of judgment meaning again near the end of the seven years at the second coming of christ the 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 separation of the two one taken one left the taken being those in judgment and the left behind being those who are left behind to inherit the kingdom of god we have another author being quoted 
uh, Arno Gabelein notes the following. Two classes were living in Noah's day, the ones who were unbelieving, and these were swept away by the divine judgment. The other class, uh, this, this quote mentions, was Noah and his house and his sons were left and not destroyed by the judgment. It will be so again in the coming of the Son of Man. The unbelievers will be taken away in the day of judgment and wrath. The others will be left on the earth to receive and enjoy the blessings of the coming age and enter the kingdom, which will then be established. And then let's talk about this parallel passage. I, I, I think I can finish this tonight. Let me see how much longer this is. Yeah, we're almost done. All right, so we will be able to finish this pastor's um, notes. So now he's got a parallel passage, and we this is why I looked at them earlier before. Another reason to see Matthew 24, 40, and 41 as illustrating ones who are taken in judgment is the parallel passage found in Luke 17, 24, and 37, which, 24 through 37, which we did read. In a previous section of Luke 17, 26 through 30, Christ speaks of the coming of the sinning man being like the days of Noah and Lot. He continues, in both illustrations, it was the wicked one who was taken in judgment, right? The wicked were taken in judgment, according to this pastor, according to the view that he believes that this is the second coming, not the rapture. Taken in judgment happens at the end of the seven years, if you're a pre-tribulationist, if you're a pre-rather, or if you're a post-tribulationist, the second coming takes place at the end of the seven years for all of those three views, and it takes place after the tribulation, uh, no matter how long you place the tribulation, whether it's seven years, three and a half years, three years, uh, or just whatever you think how long the tribulation is. Um, in both illustrations, he noticed that it's the wicked one who's taken in judgment. Luke 17, 27 says, the flood came and destroyed them. And I highlighted that earlier to show you that it's a different Greek word. Luke 17, 28 to 29 says, it was the same as happened in the days of Lot and destroyed them all. Emphasis added. Luke 17, 34 through 36 gives three illustrations of the separation of believers and unbelievers. Then the following question is asked by disciples. Notice that Luke's account has this final question tacked on the end, whereas in Matthew, it's way up earlier into the narrative about where the vultures are, there the bodies will be gathered, where the bodies are there, the vultures will be gathered, etc., etc. Um, the quote from Luke reads, though, where, where uh, the disciples ask, where, Lord? This question means, where are the unbelievers taken? According to this author's view, Jesus answered, Wherever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. And then he goes on to talk about eagles in this context implies vultures who hover over and scavenge a dead corpse. Thus, anyone would be able to see where a dead belly is because of the vultures hovering above. Reference Revelation 19, 17 through 21. Such language clearly supports the notion, this author says, that the ones taken are removed in judgment. Maranatha. May the Lord come quickly. Okay, so that'll do it for this particular author's perspective on this passage. I'll scroll back up to the top so you can kind of see who wrote this again. This was Thomas Ice. His commentary is found at blueletterbible.org, and he was discussing this question of who will be taken and who will be left, and when is the time frame, and we left off with this particular conclusion from his perspective. I believe he's a pre-tribber. His perspective is that there is a rapture, and I'm concluding with this, there's a rapture, I'm sorry, let me back up, there's a seven-year slice of final history given over to humanity, humanity's wicked um, and rebellious state of affairs and state of existence that will be um, in existence at the time when it's time for Jesus to return to planet Earth. His return is split up into two events, kind of bookends. The one on the far left is the rapture. The one on the far right is the second coming. These are two separate events according to most pre-trib raptures, pre-trib um, believers. Pre-tribbers believe that the rapture is at the beginning of the seven years or even outside of it, but not very far outside of it, meaning the church will be raptured prior to any seven-year tribulation hitting planet Earth. So, in the pre-trib rapture, we're taken to be with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The tribulation then takes place on planet Earth. It runs the course of seven years. And then at the far right of the chart, the second coming, where Jesus returns with his saints, occurs after the tribulation, and that's when those who are taken will be those who are taken in judgment, and those who are left behind are those who will be left behind, I'm sorry, those who are taken, yes, those who are taken will be taken in judgment, 
and excluded from the kingdom. And those who are left behind will are those who will be left behind to inherit the kingdom that Jesus is going to establish on planet Earth at the far right of this particular slide. So that's basically what we just discussed. And what we'll do next week is we'll turn into, we'll go from this gentleman's commentary into uh, another perspective given by Tim Haig, who, and I, I purposely turned away from the page so you wouldn't be able to see uh, and begin to read his perspective. Um, we'll turn to that next week and see uh, is he in agreement with what, the, what this gentleman said about taking in the left and, and when this st takes place, or does he have a different perspective to take? I haven't even tell you what I believe yet, um, but I did show you just a kind of a hint at that uh, by showing you these two slides, two events, Rapture versus Second Coming, Rapture versus Second Coming. But that'll do it for Eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events.